Good morning. Good to see you all. Our first reading this morning actually comes from two different poets. We have um, Padraig Otuma, a poet in his own right, introducing a work by Robert Hayden and sharing a little bit about what it means to him. So it starts off with Padraig, and then I'll let you know when the poem starts. <clears throat> I always think that time is a character in every poem. Sometimes it's loud, other times it's a quiet foundation. Time and its passing seems to be present in the magnificent Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden from his collected poems in 1966. A man recalls the gestures of love enacted by his father during Detroit winters gestures that perhaps were not noticed or valued by the son at the time. I always think that the poet is older now, perhaps after the death of his father or perhaps of a similar age his father was when the boy, boy poet's memories were forming. He's seeing the love, those austere and lonely offices. From here, from this time of writing, he reflects. And now I'll begin the poem by Robert Hayden. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Look at those that <clears throat> now Padgett comes back and uh, reflects on the poem. Look at these adjectives, blue, black, cracked, weekday, banked, chronic, austere, lonely and the other descriptors, adverbs, adverbial nouns too, ached, splintering, breaking, slowly, indifferently. This is a poem of reflection, a poem that looks back with the kind of wisdom only time and aging can do. I don't find it to be a sad poem, even though it's a poem that doesn't deny sadness. I find it to be a grounding poem about the actions of love even in a house with those chronic angers. And what better way to start this year than with a question about love? What now that you are the magnificent age that you are, do you now recognize as love, even if it was difficult to recognize at the time? This is the substance of the poetry of our lives and the substance of the art of living. Our second reading, um, you may notice that I digress from the lectionary, um, comes from James chapter one, verses 19 through 26. Remember this, my dear sisters and brothers, be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to anger. For God's justice is never served by our anger. So do away with all your filth and the last vestiges of wickedness, wickedness in you. Humbly welcome the word which has been planted in you because it has power to save you. But act on this word because if all you do is listen to it, you're deceiving yourselves. Those who listen to God's word but don't put it into practice are like those who look into mirrors at their own faces. They look at themselves and then go off and promptly forget what they look like. But those who look steadily at the perfect law of freedom and make it their habit, not listening and then forgetting, but actively putting it into practice will be blessed in all that they do. If those who don't control their tongues imagine that they are devout, they're deceiving themselves and their worship is pointless. Pure, unspoiled religion in the eyes of our Abba God is this, coming to the aid of widows and orphans when they are in need and keeping oneself uncontaminated by this world. Mm. 
<clears throat> to prepare for today's sermon, just before what would have been Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 94th birthday, I reread the letter that he wrote from the Birmingham jail in 1963 where he was imprisoned as a participant in a nonviolent demonstration against segregation. The document transports you to a particular time and place. And yet, unfortunately, so much of the wisdom still resonates in the face of today's racial and economic problems. I read the letter looking for lessons that could be applied to us here and now towards the elusive goal of justice. I walked away being reminded that justice can not be reduced to a formula. I walked away reminded that as the theologian Walter Brueggemann puts it, there are silences that are hard to break from the pulpit. It's hard to talk about how our society has chosen a path of death We've reduced everything to a commodity. We rely on technology to solve every problem, even as it creates a whole set of new ones. The ideology of consumer capitalism that we all subscribe to is an inadequate dehumanizing way to live. And yet preachers are entrusted to talk about it, even as we are deeply implicated in it. I noticed my own complicity on my daughter's recent visit home from college on winter break. She is halfway through her undergraduate degree, studying in Prague in the Czech Republic and hoping to remain there to make a life for herself after graduating in 17 short months. Her dad and I had to have some difficult conversations with her that boiled down to one simple question. How are you going to support yourself financially once you graduate? I know I'm not the only one who's had to have these conversations, but it's only after she left that I thought about all the questions that we failed to ask her. Like, how are you gonna be a compassionate person committed to mutual care? Or, how are you gonna put yourself on the line to disrupt oppressive systems? Not only didn't I ask those questions, but to make matters worse, <clears throat> when she talked about a feminist startup organization that she's excited about, I warned her that of course, the leaders of this startup will be eager for her enthusiastic unpaid labor, but I wanted her to consider the opportunity cost where she could spend time earning money in or on more impressive resume building endeavors. I have drank the Kool-Aid. I'm afraid Dr. King would not be impressed by the values that I'm choosing to emphasize as I parent my young adult. Where in your life might you be failing to ask the questions that actually reflect your inherent divinity? An ideology is a worldview, a lens that people use to make sense of the world. Christianity is a worldview. White supremacy delusion is also a worldview, one that was adopted to amass power under the guise of capitalism. People go to great lengths to protect their ideologies, like creating a tax structure that favors the rich. The letter from the Birmingham jail tells us much about Dr. King's ideology and the lengths he was willing to go to to turn systems that made no sense to him upside down and inside out. Let's uncover some of the tenets of Dr. King's worldview that are gems for the taking when you mine this eloquent letter. He starts off by explaining how penning this letter is in response to a public statement of concern issued by white religious leaders of the South <clears throat> was an exception to his own rule, just writing the letter. The rule was that he usually did not take time to answer criticism of his work and ideas. For if he sought to answer all the criticisms that crossed his desk, 
he said he would be engaged in little else. In that, I hear him beckoning us. What exceptions do you need to make to your own rules? In addition to that, I hear the warning and assurance that when you are working on the right side of justice, you should expect a lot of criticism. The next argument that he speaks to is the criticism that he and his fellow disruptors were outsiders coming in. To that, he reminds his fellow clergy opposers that in fact, he and his staff were invited there by local affiliates in, the Bir Bir in Birmingham. And he says, beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. In this, he's urging us to carry the gospel of freedom beyond our particular hometown, but in a way that is following the lead of those most impacted. And where we get one of his most fav famous quotes, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Ultimately, Dr. King shares the worldview that he is a proponent of nonviolent direct action that seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. He compels us to dramatize the issue until it can no longer be ignored. He encourages legitimate and unavoidable impatience, saying, wait has almost always meant never. One line that he states hits home because it still rings truer than it should. He says, and I quote, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Fast forward to 2021, when 19.5% of Black people living in the United States were living below the poverty line. This is compared to 8.2% of white people. Dr. King is compelling us to take an honest inventory and to harness our impatience, to let people's stories more than the statistics transform us to take direct action. Unless we feel good about ourselves as people of faith, Dr. King goes on to say that the Negro's great stumbling block to freedom is not the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. He says lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. It sounds like patience with the status quo felt like a slap in the face to Dr. King. The time for action is now and we must have urgency. He urges us to be extremists and to be proud of the label. But he asks, what kind of extremist will we be? What does an extremist for love look like? It looks a little like the mutual care we offer each other in this very community, but with a willingness to put more on the line, to be less apathetic to the cost that others pay for the status quo, even if it's serving us well and fine. Dr. King is speaking to us directly from beyond the grave when he says, and I quote, the contemporary church is so often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. Dr. King begins to bring the letter to a close by stating, I have no fear about the outcome of the struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Dr. King is compelling us to recapture the sacrificial nature of the early church, 
when people suffered for what they believed. Christian care is communal care. Let's be inspired to think about our notions of care and the sacrifices we are being called to as we accept the reality that we are all the victims of a broken promise. I also believe that Dr. King wasn't worried about the outcome because while there was a part for him and his team to play, he knew that ultimately this was a spiritual fight and that the Holy Spirit would be the one to lead the victory. We also can have that assurance as we think about our part to play. But let us be impatient with the white supremacist delusion and ideology of consumer capitalism and determine what direct, direct action is ours to take individually and as a church community that has a worldview that with God on our side, all things are possible. For this reason, my beloved sibling, be steadfast, always <clears throat> unmovable, always abounding in the work of God for your labor is not in vain. The scripture we read from the book of James says, but those who look into the perfect law, the law of freedom and make it their habit, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in all their doing. May you be blessed in your doing. May we all be blessed for our impatience. May we strive together to be extremists for love. This is the good news of God. Amen.